Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. All right. I'm excited tonight to continue to uh, talk to you from the books of First and Second Thessalonians. Uh, we're calling this uh, Be Ready, and I think I've taken care of everything else I, I need to take care of tonight. So now we're going to go uh, settle down to the teaching, and I glanced at my watch. We've got about 40 minutes before the uh, children's services are over, and we try to coordinate fairly closely. We're going through the books of First and Second Thessalonians on Wednesday nights. We're calling it Be Ready, because one of the primary themes of First and Second Thessalonians concerns the coming of the Lord, concerns the fact that the rapture of the church is the next event on God's timetable of prophetic end time events, and we need to be ready. Jesus said, for in an hour that you think not, the Son of Man comes. The the concept of the imminent return of Christ. Imminent means that you do not know when it's going to happen. It's imminent. It's unexpected. It's unanticipated. The doctrine of the imminent return of Christ, in my opinion, is one of the most important doctrines of the church. It's one of the most important messages that we should be talking about and preaching in this hour. And I'm not trying to be critical of anybody else, but it's a message that hardly anybody is teaching in the body of Christ today. How many times do you hear messages on the second coming of the Lord how many times do you hear messages on the rapture it seems like so many have uh, begun to develop the attitude that well we don't want to scare people we don't want to be um, just extreme we don't want to be uh, excitement oriented and so the message of the rapture is not talked about like it should so we're going through the books of first and second Thessalonians and primarily we're doing a verse by verse teaching that's what we normally do on Wednesday night but there are occasions like tonight where we're going to break from a verse by verse process and we're going to talk a little bit topical and we're going to talk to you specifically tonight about understanding the rapture. Turn to your neighbor and say it's going to be about the rapture. Come on, go ahead and tell them that. It's going to be about the rapture. Yeah, that's, that's what it's going to be about. Understanding the rapture. You say, what in the world is that? Well, I'll explain to that in a little bit. The reason we're doing this is we've gotten to chapter 1, verse 10. We've, for the last couple of weeks, got through the first chapter, and we got to verse number 10. And verse number 10, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1 says, And to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Now that is an awesome verse. That is a powerful verse. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven. Literally, it's like to wait up for his son from heaven. How many know what it's like when your kids are out late and, and you're, you're uneasy until they get home? You're not going to go to sleep. Some of you that have small children, just wait till your kids start driving. You've got a whole new experience in front of you. You will wait up for your kids to get home. The body of Christ is to wait up for Jesus, his son, to come from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, and then notice this last phrase, and this what's got us onto this subject, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Literally, who is the continuously delivering us from the wrath to come one. Who is Jesus? He is the continuously delivering us from the wrath to come one. That's who he is. So this is the first mention in 1 Thessalonians of the doctrine or the message of the second coming of Jesus. The second coming of Christ. It's a very important doctrine. It's a doctrine that's not being preached and emphasized in the church today. It's mentioned on average uh, approximately every 13th verse in the New Testament. It says something about the second coming of Christ. We are to literally wait up. We are to wait up. There's the analogy there of the uh, virgins in Matthew chapter 25. Some had their lamps trimmed and ready. The others had fallen asleep. We are to wait up. We are to be alert and self-controlled and awake. We are to not slumber, but to wait up for the coming of the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, the only begotten, one-of-a-kind Son, who is literally coming out of the heavens, who is the continuously delivering us from the wrath of to come one. And we need that kind of an anticipation. I know that the church has sometimes been criticized for having a pie in the sky mentality. 
accused of having an, an escapism mentality. And I can't linger there right now, but take my word for it. There is a real segment in the body of Christ today that does not even believe in the rapture, does not even believe in the second coming of Christ. They have the mentality that we're just going to create heaven on earth. And then when we get this earth so heavenly uh, created that, that Jesus is just going to come back and we're going to hand him the kingdom. How many know the apostle Paul said in the last days things are going to wax worse to worse? In the last days people will become lovers of pleasure rather than lovers lovers of God, having a form of God. All you have to do is read the six o'clock news or, or read your newspaper, listen to the six, and you know that that kingdom now mentality doesn't make any sense. It doesn't take a theological education to know that that doctrine just don't work. But Jesus is going to come and rescue us and rapture the church into the heavens. And he is the continuously delivering us from the wrath to come one. So this opens our subject now to the concept of the rapture. The rapture is, and this is simple, but I just want to approach it on a simplistic level. It's the first aspect of the second coming of Christ. The second coming of Christ, called in the scripture the day of the Lord, is really a combination of events. There, there are several things that are uh, meshed together in the idea of the day of the Lord, in, in the second coming of Christ. But the very first thing, the first event of that process, of that series of events, is what we call the rapture, which is the catching away of the church. This is the idea of the, of the movies and the books left behind. It's the idea that two are sleeping in the bed. One will be taken, the other left. Two will be grinding at the hand mill. One will be taken, the other left. Two will be working in the field. One will be taken, the other left. It is the idea that there will be a translation, that there will be a catching away, that there will be a, a rapture of the saints of God from the earth into the presence of Jesus. And probably the most thorough verse that teaches this in the Bible is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. So go a couple chapters over to chapter 4, verse 13, and this is what we read. And I want to pause to say this quickly. There are the critics that will say the word rapture is not in the Bible. They're right. But there's a lot of other biblical doctrines. The word Trinity is not in the Bible either. But how many know that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? So even though the word rapture is not in the Bible, the teaching of a catching away is certainly in the Bible. And this is the most prominent verse, chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians, verse 13. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that's Greek idiom for having died. It doesn't mean they're spiritually slumbering. It literally means they've experienced physical death. That you may not grieve as others who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive and are left until the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. And here is the promise of the rapture. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of a command, with the voice of the archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and are left, meaning Christians that are alive on the earth at this particular time in the timetable of God, will be caught up together with them. With who? With the Lord, but also with the saints that had already been in the presence of God that came back with Jesus to receive his church from the earth as we are caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now remember that uh, 18th verse. I'll get back to that a little bit later. We encourage one another with these words. That catching away, that being raptured is the next event on God's timetable of prophetic happenings, the coming of the Lord. Now, is that the entire coming of the Lord? No, there's a lot more involved in that. Uh, there's the rapture, 
then on the earth there's going to be tribulation. There's going to be a great distress. There's going to be the revelation of the Antichrist. There's going to be all kinds of things as they're revealed in the book of Revelation of uh, the devastations and the destructions and the judgments and so on. Then uh, there's going to be what we call... Uh, Compared to the rapture, there's going to be the revelation of Christ. And the revelation of Christ is when Christ actually comes back to the earth with his church to establish his millennial kingdom, which will be for a thousand years reign of peace on the earth. I'm just trying to give you an overview. But the thing I want to focus on tonight is the rapture, this catching away, the first thing. And by the way, There is absolutely nothing that would prevent that from happening tonight. There are no prophecies that have to be fulfilled. There are no predictions. Well, the rapture can't happen because of this or that. No, there is no reason whatsoever why Jesus couldn't rapture us into the presence of God before I get finished preaching here tonight. In fact, how many think I ought to just go on and do a marathon and see if I can last until the rapture? Maybe if I went for three or four hours, I... Some of you think, I don't think you can do that. Oh, believe me, I can do it. (laughs) You might all be asleep, (laughs) but I can do it. There's no reason why the rapture couldn't take place. It's the next event on the prophetic timetable of God. Now, I want to take time right now and, and do this really quickly. There are a lot of people now that have different opinions of when the rapture is going to take place. In in theology, the end times or what we call the study of eschatology. Uh, there's uh, different studies in systematic uh, studies, systematic theology. Christology, what's that the study of? Yeah, you guys are brilliant. It's the study of Christ, Christology. Pneumatology. Yeah, the study of the person of the Holy Spirit. He's the pneuma. He's the Holy Spirit of God. Soteriology, that's a little bit more complicated. It's the study of salvation, the doctrine of our salvation. Ecclesiology. The study, hey, you guys are brilliant. The ecclesia is the assembly of called out ones. The church is the ecclesia. So ecclesiology is the study of the church. So there's all these studies. And in eschatology now, then there's different schools of thought concerning this event called the rapture. Some don't even think there really is a rapture. And then others are about arguing about when the rapture is going to take place. And their arguments based on two main events, two main terms. And I'm not going to take a lot of time to explain this in detail, but give you the overview. There's what we call the millennium. Milli, that's a thousand, millimeter, milli annum, million, uh, a thousand years, not a million years, but a a milli, which is a a thousand years, millennium. And so there are premillennials, meaning the rapture takes place before the millennium, postmillennials, the rapture takes place after the millennium. And then there's also the other term that is used, tribulation, that refers to the seven year time of great destruction and um, turmoil and distress that will be on the earth. So there are premillennial, postmillennial people. Then in the premillennial camp, there are pre-tribulation, post-tribulation, mid-tribulation, and all that. So what I want to give you is a few reasons why I am totally, completely convinced of the message of a pre-millennial rapture, meaning a catching away prior to the thousand years, but not just a pre-millennial, also a pre-tribulation rapture, the catching away of the church prior to the seven-year period of time that would precede the 1,000-year reign of peace of Jesus on the earth. And I want to give you, I think I have 10 reasons, and I think I can go through them in the next... uh, 30 minutes or so, but the first one is like an overarching reason. This is like the main reason, and this is the foundation for all the other reasons. I am totally convinced that the church will not go through the great tribulation on the earth. The church will be raptured, caught up in the presence of God before all of that happens on the earth. And uh, I know that if we, you know, read the book of Revelation, some of that can sound pretty scary. And you see the man of sin coming on the scene and you hear uh, uh, the uh, 
Antichrist and the 666 and, and all of that. People can get caught up in, in a lot of fear if they're not careful. Rest assured, I am completely convinced that if you are a Christian in right relationship with Jesus Christ and you remember our verse, waiting up, we, if you're waiting up, for the coming of the Lord, by the way, it says in 1 John that everyone that has this hope within him purifies himself even as he is also pure. What that means, if I'm expecting, I just got to preach here for a minute, is that okay? If I'm expecting the rapture to take place today, I'm not going to go to places that I wouldn't expect Jesus to show up and rapture me out of. I'm old school. You have to understand that. I grew up in the generation where we were told you don't go to the picture shows because if the rapture takes place and you're in that movie theater, it's dark in there and it's smoky in there and all those people are in there watching those pictures. Jesus ain't going to come in there to rapture you. So you don't go to the picture shows and you don't go here and you don't go there. Well, there's some truth to all of that. Now, I know I'm not legalistic and, and we don't need to live in a legalistic mentality but we do need to have an expectation in our hearts of the soon coming of the Lord because if I'm expecting Jesus to come back soon it's going to change the way I live I'm not going to live a sloppy life. I'm not going to have sloppy agape, greasy grace. I'm not going to take advantage of the faithfulness of God if I think, well, Jesus isn't going to come back for 100 years, so I'm just going to live it up, and then after I've sown my wild oats and prayed for a crop failure, then I'm... That went right over some of your head. That's what a lot of people do. They sow wild oats, and then they pray for a crop failure because whatsoever man sows, that shall he also reap, and they don't want to reap what they've sown anyway. So I'm just getting too much revelation here as I'm, I'm talking too much inspiration if my wife were here tonight she right now she would go into deep intercession because I'm getting a little bit beside myself but we need to have the expectation of the coming of the Lord so let me give you and this is the first thing this is the main reason that supersedes all the other reasons the purpose of what we call the great tribulation period has nothing to do with the church that's the main reason it overrides all the other reasons why the church isn't going to go through the tribulation because the tribulation doesn't have anything to do with the church. It's not to purify the church. It's not to punish the church. It's not to uh, have some sort of purification rite or some sort of, uh, you know, like... Uh, uh, process where the church is refined by the fires of persecution no it doesn't have anything to do with the church the tribulation the seven year period of time has to do with the nation of israel and god's plan to complete his promise to bring israel back to himself and i can't linger too long but i do want to read a verse for you or a few verses over in the book of daniel so find daniel uh, for me real quick, uh, Daniel chapter 9, and uh, I want to read just a few verses starting in verse number 24. Daniel chapter 9, starting with verse 24, says this, 70 weeks or 70 sevens are decreed about your people. It's writing to Daniel. Daniel's a Jew, so he's writing to Israel, the Jewish people, 70 weeks, 70 sevens are decreed for your people, Israel, and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place. You know, therefore, and understand, but from the going out of the word to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince. There shall be seven sevens. And I've explained all this chronology before, so I'm not going to linger on that. But then for 62 weeks or 62 sevens, it shall be guilt, built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. And after the 62 sevens, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing uh, left. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and all that. So if you read this passage, what Daniel is saying is that in God's plan for Israel, prophetically, symbolically, it's symbolized by 
a, a period of 77s, 70 weeks, 77s. And if you read this passage carefully, it explains that 62 sevens have already transpired and then another seven sevens have already transpired, which 62 plus seven is 69. You guys are brilliant. And we started out with how many? 70 sevens. And 69 of them have already been transpired. So what's left? One. One seven. One week or one seven year period of time. That is the biblical foundation for what is called the seven year period of time called great tribulation. Now, tribulation is the seven years. Sometimes the word the great tribulation refers to the last half of the seven years, the last three and a half years. But this is called here in Daniel the time of Jacob's trouble, the time of Israel's trouble. And the purpose for this seven-year period, which will take place after the church is caught away in the rapture, is to open the hearts and the uh, eyes of Israel to bring them into the full revelation of who Jesus is so that all Israel can be saved. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, I think I have this verse, says, But their minds were hardened. How many have ever tried... Uh, and even if you haven't personally tried, but you're aware that there is a very strong resistance to the gospel, to the message of Jesus in, to people that have a Jewish uh, nationality, a, a Jewish heritage, a, a Jewish mindset. And this verse says, because their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the old covenant, that same veil remains unlifted. In other words, and it's very true, when I read about the lambs that were slain all the way through the Old Testament, it's a no-brainer for me. I say, wow, every Old Testament lamb is a type of Jesus. He, he is preparing the way. He is painting the picture that the Lamb of God, Jesus, was slain before the foundations of the world. And all the Old Testament sacrifices were a foreshadowing of the coming of Jesus. Because when John the Baptist saw him for the very first time, even though he was a cousin to him, and they grew up and they played with each other, when he saw him coming into his ministry, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So whenever I read types and symbols and things in the Old Testament, because I know Jesus, it's like, wow, how can anybody not see this? How can anybody not understand that the whole book is a book about Jesus? Well, the reason is because there's a veil. There is a covering. And when the Old Covenant, the Old Testament is read, that veil remains unlifted uh, because only through Christ is it taken away. And in this end time, in this tribulation, the season of Jacob's trouble, Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11 explain this, and you could read them. Just sit down and read through Romans 9, 10, and 11. God shows how that through great tribulation, through great distress, through great turmoil that will come on the earth, the eyes and the hearts of the Jewish people that have rejected Jesus will turn to Jesus and that Israel will embrace the Lord. Now, that's not to say that Israel gets a free pass. What that is saying is that they will have the opportunity to receive Jesus just like you and I receive Jesus and be saved. It's not like God is going to say, oh, okay, now Israel's automatically saved. No, they're automatically saved just like you and I are automatically saved if we recognize what Jesus did for us on the cross. And God will lift that veil. He will lift that hardening of their hearts so that they then will be able to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and so be saved. So this tribulation has nothing to do with the church. It's not a purifying time for the church. <laughs> I've heard the old timer say it's not a Pentecostal purgatory. <laughs> it's not for the church to get purified. It's not a time of chastisement. It doesn't have anything to do with the church. So that's the primary reason why the church won't go through the tribulation because the tribulation is not designed in God's wisdom to have anything to do with the church. It's designed to awaken the hearts of Israel and you have to study you know, Revelation in Romans 9, 10, and 11, and I'm just trying to allude to some of these verses so that you can understand 
all of that. So let me give you now, and I have, that's the overriding reason. That's the foundation for everything. But I want to take you now through, and I think I have 10 of these, 10 reasons. Man, our time is going too fast. Will you guys just click the button and stop the clock for me? You, you take care of that, JR. Stop, stop the clock for me. I only need about 30 minutes, okay? Just stop the clock for 30 minutes, and then we'll be okay. And by the way, how many give me an extra five minutes here tonight? It's a very old joke. Very, very, very old joke. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. It's a very old joke, but you guys still fall for it. What can I say? Some people never learn. But uh, reasons. Number one, I'll go quickly. Number one, it's impossible for the church to go through the great tribulation since most of the church will already be with the Lord. Now, think about that. At the time of the rapture, the only people that will be on the earth are the Christians that are alive at that particular moment. How many, how many Christians are on the earth today? I don't know, millions, I'm sure. You know, hundreds of millions. But in the scope of eternity, there's only a fraction of an amount of Christians that are alive on the earth today compared to all the people that have served God through all the ages past. Amen. And if the church was going to go through the tribulation, how could that be? Because way over high percentage of them have already been with the Lord because they've already died and they've already been absent from the body is present with the Lord. For, so for the Lord to allow the church in our day to go through the tribulation would be completely um, inconsistent. It would be completely unjust. It would be like, okay, if you, ever, if you lived in the 18th century, 17th century, if you lived in years gone by and uh, you died and you were absent from the body and the present with the Lord, you're blessed and, and you're enriched and you live in the presence of God forever. But for you people that happen to be alive, at the moment of the rapture in the 21st century, you people are the ones that have to go through the tribulation. You see how that would be so inconsistent. It would not make sense and God is just because, again, the tribulation doesn't have anything to do with the church. Secondly, there is no scriptural support of any kind that indicates that the church will go through the great tribulation. There's lots of scriptural proof that the church will not go through the tribulation, but there's no scriptural support of any kind that indicates that the church will go through the tribulation. I'm moving quickly. Thirdly, the fact that the tribulations or the fact that tribulations and sufferings are predicted for the church, that fact does not constitute an evidence that the church will go through the great tribulation period. How many know that we're in this world, you will have trouble? I've got that verse for you, John 16, 33. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace, for in this world you will have tribulation. I hope that's not a surprise to anyone in this room tonight. I hope I'm not bursting your bubble. I'm going to tell you right now, if you come to Jesus and get saved, you still will have trouble. There will be trials and tribulations in the earth. You've probably heard that story. I've got to move quick, but the guy that got saved came to his pastor and said, Oh, pastor, everything is wonderful. I can't believe how supernatural my life is since I gave my heart to the Lord. And the pastor said, Oh, that's great. He, he came back the next week or two, and he said, How's your Christian walk going? Oh, it's going really good, but I'm telling you what, I'm, I'm starting to have some struggles. I'm starting to really go through some battles. And, and the pastor said, Oh, I understand that. And he came back the third week, and, and the guy was so down. He said, Pastor, how long do you have to be saved before the devil stops, stops, uh, stops battling you? How long do you have to be saved before he ever gives up on you? And the pastor said, I didn't have the heart to tell him <laughs> that he, he never gives up on you. In this world, you will have trouble. i got to hurry here, but that's tribulation. It's distress. It's trouble. In fact, I'm seeing my... You're not doing a very good job of stopping the watch, at least not this one. So uh, I may just have to linger over into next week on this. Oh, by the way, I'm going to be out of time. Well, I'll be here for service next week, but I got district council. And Omar is going to be bringing a message next Wednesday night. So I may have to continue this in two weeks. But let me just stick on this trouble thing for a little bit. There's three sources of trouble. Me, myself, and I. No, not really. Three sources of trouble, trials and tribulation in this earth. The world... The flesh and the devil. 
Three sources of trouble. And trouble means distress. It's literally the word thlipsis, if I can pronounce that correctly, that means pressure. What it literally means is the world, the flesh, and the devil is outraged about what God is doing in your life. So there is pressure from the outside that is trying to cave in on you to get you to give up on the faith that is on the inside to walk forward in the kingdom of God. Now, like I said, and I'm, I'm not being cute, I'm being very serious right now, and I'm just going to talk for a while and minister, and if I don't get through all these points, I'll do them next time. There's pressure in this world today. If you're a Christian, you are under Satan's crosshairs. You are under pressure today. I've been saved a long, long time. I've been in the ministry a long time. I've been pastoring churches, uh, not just this one, but private ministries for, for 30 years, 35 years now, more than that in full-time Christian ministry. And I'm not crying the blues, but I'm telling you this in the sincerity of my heart. There is a stronger battle in the Christian faith to press forward and pursue the righteousness and the peace of God in your life today than what there's ever been. And you say, well, pastor, we should all be grown up now. We should be stronger today. It should be getting easier today. Yeah, that's what our flesh would think. But the reality is the battle gets more intense because the stakes are getting higher, the end is getting closer, and Satan is pulling out all the stops to try to put pressure into our lives to get us to despair, to uh, get discouraged, and to give up. So... The battle that's raging within you don't really, I, I'm not, probably not making anybody's day here tonight, but I'm just being honest with you. Don't expect it to get easier. Don't expect it to be a cakewalk. Don't expect it to be a retirement home experience with God and you're just going to coast on into eternity. It's going to get tougher. It might get worse than it is right now. God only knows what could happen in America. <laughs> The, the three stooges that we got running for, for political office. I mean, tell you, no telling what could happen in this nation. And I don't mean to say that in a, in a uh, dishonoring way. We don't know what's going to happen. It could get a lot worse in some regards. So the pressure that's on the outside is trying to cave you in. But here's a verse. Oh, I'm going to minister this verse. I'm just going to finish this off tonight. I've only covered three points here, but these are three good ones. But here's your verse for tonight. This is what will make your day. 1 John 4, 4. Little children, you are have from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. I want you to get this picture, and I'll give you about a five-minute illustration, and then I'll close and I'll pray over you. There is pressure on the outside that is trying to get you to cave in, trying to overcome you, overwhelm you, uh, discourage you, defeat you. But John says the pressure that's on the inside of you is greater than the pressure that's on the outside of you that's why you're not going to cave in that's why you're not going to surrender that's why you're not going to give up that's why you're not going to despair because the pressure that's on the outside is great enough to keep you strong and the pressure on the uh, on the inside is strong and it won't be defeated by the pressure on the outside and if you've never heard me tell this story i guarantee you you'll remember this you go down to tarpon springs and you get on the sponge box and you go out on the boat and they'll go a little ways out there in the channel and they'll have a diver. I've been on one of these boats a number of times. Every time we have people come from out of town, you know, I don't know what it is from famous about the sponge docks in Tarpon Springs, but we take them down there and the diver is going to jump off of the boat and go down in the water. But what does he do? He puts on his diving suit and before he jumps in the water, he puts on his old school, old fashioned cast iron helmet. And then I don't know that the waters of Tarpon Springs by you there are not that deep. But in the open seas environment, before he would go overboard into the water, he's in his suit, but he's got a cord. He's got a a tube, a hose connected. 
so that when he goes off of the boat down into an oh somebody's got to get this when he goes down into an alien environment he can't survive in that alien environment his lungs can't breathe underwater he can't withstand the pressure and i know again the pressures of the tarpon springs by you are not that deep but in an open sea if he went hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of feet down under the water the pressure in that alien environment would crush his body would crush that cast iron helmet but they've devised a perfect solution there is a cord attached to him and it he's in an alien environment where he cannot survive on his own but he's attached to somebody up on the mothership. And someone up on the ship has their hand on the regulator. And they're making sure that the pumps are operating correctly so that air is being pumped into that suit so that the air that's on the inside of that suit is greater than the pressure that's on the outside of that suit. And if his cable to the uh, homeland gets severed and the pressure on the inside is not maintained he would be crushed his body would literally be destroyed instantaneously but the pressure that's on the inside is strong enough to neutralize the pressure that's on the outside because greater is he that is living in you oh, come somebody shout on this greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world and in this world you will have trouble the world the flesh and the devil will be outraged at trying to destroy you but greater is the pressure of he that is in you than the pressure of he that is without you and you will be able to be strong in the midst of the battle now I got off on that by saying this in this world you will have trouble but the trials and the tribulations that are predicted for the church are not an indication that we will endure what is called the great tribulation period it's just general trials and tribulations that we will go through and uh, I was very optimistic when I wrote these notes today I thought I would get all the way through number 10 and give you about five scriptures on the end to conclude with but I got through number three the emphasis is though that the church is going to experience this promise of the rapture, the catching away of the body of Christ. And I want to ask you tonight, I know it's Wednesday night, I know that everybody here is, is, is just probably, uh, you know, you wouldn't be here if you didn't love the Lord and were committed to the work of God. But I want you to bow your heads with me and I want you to close your eyes tonight. And I want to make absolutely certain that every person in this room has in your life a living personal relationship with Jesus and you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that if the catching of the way the rapture of the church were to happen tonight before you get home on a Wednesday night May the 11th I think it is 2016 that you would be absent from the body present with the Lord because Jesus is in your heart and in your life and if you don't know that, for sure, I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about having um, earned your salvation. I'm not talking about some religious experience. I'm talking about a personal relationship with Jesus. Because you've asked him to come into your heart. And he's forgiven and forgotten every sin you've ever committed. Given you the hope of eternal salvation. Is everyone in the room tonight all in? You're all in with that. Raise your hand with me. Come on, just wave at me for a minute. Pastor Coates, I'm all in for that. I believe in that. I, I, I have received Jesus as my Savior and Lord. Praise God. Can we pray a prayer? In fact, I don't know, maybe there's some that they're just not sure or you, you just need confidence. You need to be um, affirmed in that tonight. It's as simple as this. And if you've prayed this prayer with me in the past, pray it with me again. You say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer once. Pray it again. It won't hurt anything. And if you've never prayed this prayer, pray it for the very first time. And know that when you mean it in your heart, God will listen to your cry. Pray this right out loud after me. Dear God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for dying on the cross to forgive me of my sin. I need you 
to come into my life. Be the strength that lives inside of me that helps me overcome the pressure on the outside that is against me. And I believe that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I believe that greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. And I commit my life to you. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. Be my very best friend. Be my hope and my salvation. And I receive you and walk in your righteousness. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. I don't know about anybody else, but I feel good just praying that myself. Praise God. I, I feel good just praying that myself. Praise the Lord. Let's stand together tonight. Praise you, God. Praise you, God. Lord, I just bless the people tonight. I pray that as they go home this evening, they have a wonderful night with their children, their families. Lord, keep them safe. Bring us back on Sunday, Lord. We're going to once again jump into the subject of, of, of faith and, and celebrate faithfulness in your, in your kingdom. And I just pray, God, that your blessing and your favor upon family first in the days that are to come as you move us into the season of the next great move of God on the earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you tonight.